Hey everybody, it's Allie and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, May 29th, 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, Jill! <laughs> When she walked into that house and said to Billy, what in the hell have you done to Catherine's house? I just about died. I nearly fell on the floor and died. It was so wonderful. And then she went on to list, I think, all of the insults that she had in her brain. I literally think the YNR writers must have gone through all of the forums and comments on blog posts, maybe even YNR chat, to muster up all of the insults that they could come up with about the new redecoration of the Chancellor Mansion, and they worked it right into the script. I mean, first of all, I loved that she said, it's swamp gray, <laughs> okay? It's not blue. Billy tried to justify it saying it's blue. Phyllis later on said, tried to justify it saying it's blue. It's swamp gray. <laughs> And then, for the little god, she called it a bordello for depressives, okay? Does that nail it right there? I mean, it is the most depressing color. It's the most depressing set on The Young and the Restless. I loved that Jill had the nerve to say it. And I gotta give YNR some props because it was almost as if YNR was knowingly and winkingly making fun of themselves. Surely they know that the fans don't love the redecoration. A lot of people were fine with a redecoration, but they've completely rehaul, re, like overhauled the thing. It's not just the paint. It doesn't look like the same place at all. I loved that Jill acknowledged that. I loved that she said, this is like I'm walking into Catherine's house where I thought I could feel her presence, where I thought I would always be able to come back and have a sense of her and have those memories and now it's like walking into a man-child's playroom. <laughs> that is truth. She says there's toys everywhere. I mean, there's women's bras in the play. It's just, it's, I mean, the, the scene of Billy coming down the stairs with his with his girl wrapped in a sheet. I mean, I think they're both just wrapped in a sheet and they're going to run downstairs to the wine cellar to get some liquor and Jill walking in on that. I can completely understand where she was coming from, why she was shocked, why she was disheartened, not only just about the house, but about her son. His whole speech about him moving Catherine's portrait to the hallway so that everybody can see it right when they walk in. I didn't buy it for a second. She said to him, you know, I know why you don't have that picture above the mantle anymore. It's because you don't want Catherine looking down on you. You don't want her overseeing all the stuff you're doing in this house. And it's true. The way that Billy is destroying his life is so very well represented in that house. And that was a point that Jill made. I was so with her in that moment. I mean, the disheartening feeling that she had walking in was, I think, the disheartening feeling that we as the fans had. Jill said, this place was our battlefield, Catherine and I. We would fight, and then we would love, and then we would fight some more. And even though she didn't turn out to actually be my mother, I felt like she was my mother. I mean, all those feelings I felt and I believed and I loved that she characterized the mansion as our battlefield. That was just the best way possibly of putting it. I mean, I felt that about the Chancellor Mansion. I felt that about their relationship. I mean, they both literally and figuratively, Catherine and Jill, went to battle over that house. Um, and I just, I, I, I felt her in that moment. And, and not only the way she felt about the house, but all week, seeing Billy and his life choices through Jill's eyes 
really put things into perspective for me. She says, Billy, this house is just another way that you are screwing up your life. That's literally what she said. I gave you this house, my son, because I thought perhaps you might want to live here with your family. I imagined dinners around the dining table. I imagined children in the yard, all, you know, presumably with Victoria, your wife. I imagined family values being in this house, even though Catherine herself was not necessarily <laughs> the world's greatest example of family values and, and, and ch chastity or, or, uh, or, or purity or anything like that. But I liked that Jill gifted him this house. And he looked like such a chump coming down those stairs too with that girl. And she was like, you live with your mother? And <laughs> he's like, I don't live with my mother. But she gave you the house. Everybody's handed you everything that you have. So can you have a little bit of respect for it? She gave you the house as a goodwill gesture, thinking it would help you move along with your life. And instead, it's just become a, a playroom, a playground, a bordello for depressives. And Jill nailed him and said, this is your problem. You have no idea of your priorities. You stole Brash and Sassy out from under Victoria. You're sleeping around. What are you doing? What are you doing with your life? And I was just so totally with her because Billy has become so unlikable to me, uh, just even probably over the course of the past two to three weeks. Look, I'm not saying that the Billy and Phyllis affair doesn't have some heat behind it. I am, was the first one to admit that, you know, it, it, is, it was a little bit hot, but I never felt like this was a good idea. I don't buy that he loves her. I don't buy that there is some bigger romantic thing going on to me, it just seems like you weren't satisfied with your own life, so you ended up wanting to take something from Jack, and Phyllis ended up getting roped into it. She cannot feel good about this affair. She cannot feel love for him. I, I just can't see it. Well, I mean, even like Ashley is starting to sniff around the situation this week. She knows that Billy has some kind of new love interest, and of all people, she goes to Phyllis. Everybody's going to Phyllis to try to fix what's wrong with Billy when the thing is what's wrong with Billy is Phyllis <laughs> and she knows that only those two know that uh, and and Ashley said something to Phyllis along the lines of yeah he's got this new woman in his life but I wouldn't want to be her because it's obviously a rebound well that has to sting Phyllis has to feel that and she has to ask herself Am I a rebound? Am I throwing away my marriage, doing this damage to my life for something that doesn't really last? I, I have to imagine that that's what's in her mind in those moments. So Phyllis is trying really hard to repair her relationship with Jack, which is the right thing to do. It was the wrong thing to do to have an affair. And on some level, I can sort of understand, at least from her perspective, why she wouldn't just go and confess to Jack, but if she goes and tries to repair the relationship, okay, maybe it's not too late for them, but they're trying to have a little romantic giveaway at the in a hotel room at the athletic club. I mean, Phyllis has got sexy lingerie. She's waiting for Jack to come up. And Billy has the nerve to sneak into that hotel room. I mean, she's standing there seductively waiting for her husband. And who should walk through the door but her husband's brother, the man she just had the affair with? Oh, no. No, I cannot believe that he had the nerve to walk up in there and then to say to her, my problem is I'm starting to worry that I can't live without you. Really? You cannot live without her when you could not live without Victoria a couple of months ago? I just don't buy it. Then he goes downstairs after he gets rejected from Phyllis and she says, no, no, no. I mean, obviously I want you, but no, no, no. He goes downstairs and he meets this waitress and the way he was so smarmy with her, she confesses that she had a crush on him and he, he, he says, oh, well, let's talk some more about that crush. And he tries to put on the Billy Abbott charm. The more he tries to do that, the more completely unlikable he becomes to me. 
I just, I, I, I don't hate him, <laughs> and it's not the actor by any means. This is the way that I think I've always <laughs> felt about Billy. He's, he's, he's calm for only short periods of time, but that whole playboy attitude bugs me, like, in life. I don't like guys or people that are like that. I've perceived Billy as being someone who is irresponsible and at times insincere, and that's just something that I don't like to see. I, I can't possibly to tolerate that in my own life, and so I'm seeing it in Billy, and I just find it to be such an unattractive quality. I, I, I wouldn't date him. I don't know why Phyllis will throw away her marriage for him. It's just... It's unbelievable to me. Um, I, I was, I think all, I guess the other thing is too, that seeing it through Jill's eyes changed my own perspective on it this week. She was just like a fresh look at the entire situation. And Jill, just like Ashley, pleads with Jack and Phyllis, of, of all people, to talk to Billy. So, uh, I mean, and she even says to Phyllis, you should go talk to Billy. You won't fall for his bad boy act. And I mean, again, that has to be this kaklunk moment with Phyllis where she thinks, am I falling for an act? Is this real? What he's saying to me, is it real? I think it is. I see it in his eyes, but it's, am I, I, surely I'm not the only one he's doing this with. I mean, she, Phyllis knows because Jill tells her that he's sleeping around with another woman. So he slept with like two other, he slept with like three women in the last three weeks. Every week it's someone else. It was Fiona, then Phyllis, then Brittany slash Bethany. I mean, they, they can't even remember her name. <sighs> he gets up under my skin. I don't like guys like that, I guess is the thing. So anyway, <laughs> Jack and Phyllis go to Billy and they try to talk to him. And God bless Jack. He, he tries. The man tries. I mean, we for years have said, Jack, don't you ever learn from, don't you ever learn your lessons? You know, to be, I wish Jack would just settle down and be a bad guy or a good guy. And now here he is settled down, being a good guy, trying to offer this wisdom to Billy. And, uh, and it just, it's, it was so awkward because they twisted it. Like Jack uh, because I think of Jill, is convinced that this other woman, this love in Billy's life, is Victoria. Yeah, you would think that. You wouldn't think it was your sister-in-law. But Jack is trying to convince him to go back to Victoria or go back to this woman that he loves. And the entire time, there's this subcontext of Billy and Phyllis looking at each other and like talking through their affair while Jack's in the room. It was so inappropriate. I felt so bad for for Jack. I mean, they should just start spelling his name C-H-U-M-P because he's becoming a chump, the chump of the show. It is humiliating. There was a scene when they were at the uh, the athletic club at their romantic uh, getaway upstairs, and Jack was just hanging out in the bathroom with his towel, like he had his bare feet. You could just, it was he was seeming very casual, and I just thought, oh Jack, you're just such a you're such a good guy, just hanging out there. There's there's not there's there's not a, 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 even a bit of bad bone in his body right now, and you are just getting played. It's it's humiliating for for him. I just I I and and it was even worse in that very last scene on Friday when they're talking it out in front of him. Uh, and, and and the thing is. Like, Phyllis is in the subcontext trying to convince Billy to uh, just move on, meaning move on from me. And Jack is saying, no, I think you need to go for the woman you love. And at the end, Billy says, all right, you're right, Jack. I will do everything I can to get the woman that I love. Ick! <laughs> it is so disrespectful. It's so disrespectful. I guess I can understand giving in to your passion because I'm, I'm a soap fan. Yeah, I guess I can understand giving in to your passion one time. But now he is actively trying to break up their marriage. He is inserting himself into their lives, breaking it up on their inner, their romantic time together. He wants her. He wants Jack to not have her. This is his goal. And I will tell you, this is the problem. This is my problem with Billy. This is what Billy does. This is exactly who Billy is. In my opinion, this is, except for very short periods of time, this is what Billy has always been. Just ask 
Victoria. Maybe it's because, as we talked about two weeks ago, I'd like to play the role of Victoria. Maybe I have uh, this this um, this penchant for identifying with her in the Billy situation. But I've always kind of identified with Victoria in her relationship with Billy. Or I suppose I've always sort of sided with with Victoria. Sorry, I can't be unbiased on this one because I just have se I feel like I've seen the way that Victoria has put up with his crap over the years. He's always this sort of in this irresponsible um, man child. Jill just put that so well man child that's always how he's been and it's charming at first I mean surely you guys have been in relationships where it's like oh this person's kind of charming and then you pull away a few of the layers and they're a wreck that's always what I've seen of Billy and Victoria has tried so hard just in my view over the years to try to stabilize him and make him a family man and keep you know help save him from himself his addictions I'm mean, gambling and drinking and this guy I mean come on she's tried so hard I think to keep him on the straight and narrow path to help him become a good father and to become a better person and there have been so many other outside factors that have affected that including Victor um, and, and, I, and I just I I always just think that if I were Victoria I probably would have been done with him I probably would have been done with him before I had kids with him in fact I'm sure <laughs> um, but I died when Jill went to Victoria and tried to convince, I mean, Jill's trying to convince anybody and everybody who will listen to help her son. She can see that he is sinking in deeper and deeper to uh, depression and indulgence and addiction. And she wants somebody to help him. And it's always been Victoria. Victoria has always been, uh, well, I mean, uh, and there have been other people, but I think she's been his main anchoring force over the past I don't know, probably nearly a decade at this point, and it just didn't work this time. Billy and Victoria are just so completely over, and frankly, I don't feel like it's her that wants to end it. I feel like it's him that that wants to end it because, as sure, you know, Jill tries to convince Victoria to take Billy back, help him, blah blah blah, and and Victoria says, "I'm sorry, no, I can't." She hears that he's been with yet another woman. It's just his he's in the down part of his cycle, and she's like, "I can't do this to myself again." So she runs to Travis, and she admits, and she straight up says that she had hopes that her and her ex-husband would get back together until today. today. Up until, so up until Friday, in the back of Victoria's mind, she's still thinking, I want to get back together with Billy. And granted, yes, she has not communicated that to him uh, or, or done a very good job of, of like being kind and loving toward him. But up until Friday, the woman's still thinking, maybe, maybe we'll be able to get back together. And I don't think Billy's thinking that. I think Billy has been off of the Victoria train since he set his little laser focus on Phyllis, which has been weeks now. So I, you tell me who, you tell me who, who is the, the impasse in Billy and Victoria's relationship. It's probably both of them. I know I'm being too Victoria biased. There. I'm, I'm biased in Victoria's favor this week. It'll swing back the other direction, who knows. But I will say, I mean, she, she, it's like, I think what she's thinking in running to Travis is, I need to think about anything except for Billy. What has happened with Billy has hurt me so deeply, and not to mention all of the other Victor stuff and other factors in her life, but I think she's running to Travis to try to forget. It is the ultimate rebound. Talk about rebound. If, if Ashley thinks Billy's rebounding with Phyllis, then Victoria is sure rebounding with Mr. Travis. She she tells him that she needs to put the brakes on. She's still, you know, she doesn't want to jump into another relationship with, again, totally understandable and, and obvious from our point of view. She hasn't even told a man her real name or what she does or any of that stuff. Uh, but, she, you know, rather than doing that, she ends up in his bed instead. She goes to, to bed with them and it just tries to sex away her pain, which is that what Billy's doing? Is, is that what Billy's doing with Phyllis? <sighs>
I mean, that's what he's doing with the other women, but what, what's really behind the motivation with Phyllis? I mean, are, where are you guys on this, by the way? Are you feeling like Billy is really, truly in love with Phyllis, or is this just a, a, a fling, a sex, something that if he gave it some time and, you know, and took out the naughty factor, would he still love her? Would he still not be able to live without her? <sighs> Anyway, while Victoria is in Travis's bed, apparently a Newman oil, <laughs> the oil rig has sprung a leak. Um, we're getting a lot of a, a lot of oil in Young and the Restless. I, I'm, it's, I'm worried. Is it going to become Dallas? Which actually would be kind of great. I loved Dallas. I loved the original Dallas. I loved the Dallas remake, or uh, what do they call it? Um, it wasn't really a remake. It was like an extension of the show that they did a couple years ago. I thought it was fantastic. Dallas all the way. So I'm all for this whole oil rig storyline, except for the fact that Summer, <laughs> maybe she is Jack's child because she is a chump too. I mean, like this oil rig has sprung a leak. Victoria cannot be reached because she's with Travis. Like as if the woman's not allowed to have a life, okay? She's allowed to turn off her phone a minute, um, but she the second she does, that's what it means. When you run a big company like that, if you turn your back for a second, there's gonna be someone there holding the knife, and right now that's Luca. Rather than just put the chill on and saying, all right, why don't we give Victoria five minutes? I mean, how long can that sex last? <laughs> all right, maybe he's really good. 20 minutes <laughs> and we'll get her opinion and then we'll move forward. No, Luca has is right there behind Summer, pushing her right into the front saying, oh, you're so smart. You're so good at identifying the larger picture. You should really be at the helm of this project at least. So, <clears throat> I think, you know, with your smarts and, and my experience, we need to get out in front of this, this oil issue. I mean, for crying out loud, they're practically, they're like getting ready to hold a press conference to respond to this issue. I don't know what they're doing, checking Victoria's email anyway, but they're getting ready to hold a press conference as Victoria, in the previews of Monday's show, is returning from her little sexcapade with Travis. Can you believe that? I mean, it, talk about overstepping. I mean, I feel bad for Victoria. The knives are out on all levels. I loved, by the way, speaking of the press, uh, that actress uh, came back who I, I who you guys told me. I was like, I know her, the reporter earlier in the week with Victoria, and you guys told me I probably knew her from Community, and that is where I saw her. I love her. She is adorable. She comes up with to Victoria with the microphone and she's asking all these questions about Newman and Victoria kind of gives her the blow off. And there was the most hilarious and almost understated, you maybe didn't even catch it moment where as the reporter's walking out the door, she glances up at Victor's portrait on the wall and says, oh, he's handsome. <laughs> And she walks out. Oh man, that was so funny. Bring her back. Come on, let's let, let's get her involved. She could be somebody's love interest. I don't care who. She's got a sense of humor, and I like her. We need that lady. Um. Oh gosh, I I tell you, I did what I don't like is what's happening with Summer and Luca right now. He called his private detective and said, and said, gave him a heads up that Victoria is probably gonna be smooching on Travis some more. And I think they got some, he got some more pictures. I just feel nauseous, by the way, that Luca is using Summer. It's like any romance between them is completely tainted by Luca's agenda. Last week's poll question was, does Victor have any real romantic feelings for Meredith? I'm fascinated by these results because 3% said, yes, I really think he does like have genuine feelings for her. 49% uh, says, no, I think he's only using her. And then the other 49% say, maybe it's a little of both. 
So, like, the majority of everyone seems to agree that Victoria, or excuse me, Victor is using Meredith on some level or another. Either it's complete or he's just, he like, he, he, the, the using of her is just a bonus to the feelings. Um, and only 3% thought it was just a, like a pure affection, which I think uh, is a valid argument. I think that Victor is very lonely and very alone right now, and it makes sense to me that he would be drawn to someone. I mean, he needs a woman and he's a, you know, he's Victor Newman. He's a very powerful man. I, I, there was, I think, a, was there another kiss this week? There was the, a moment last week or this week where he goes in for a kiss and with his mustache, rubs his mustache all over his face and then he does, he takes two steps back and just puts his hands in his pockets and stands there like, he's just almost still like this 18 year old guy in his mind. You know, like, yeah, I just planted that Victor Newman kiss on you. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> Everything I want you to, obviously. Um, gosh, Victor literally has to punch the wall every single time anyone visits him. And that gets him sent right to the infirmary where he plays the victim with Meredith. I will concede that maybe he does have very real feelings for her, but I just think that in the back of his mind, he has to be seizing upon this opportunity. Would he feel the way that he does about her if her father wasn't in charge of the parole board? I just don't think so. And the way we see him talking to his family or having those meetings with, with whoever's coming to visit him and being vicious or being, I mean, and not that he's always vicious, but being Victor, okay? And then he goes back to the to her office and he's all sweet with her and playing the victim and having, you know, her say, they don't deserve you, Victor. It's, it's suspicious. I, I just, I don't trust that he has totally pure intentions when it comes to her and I feel sorry for her at the end of the day because I do think that she's being blinded by the amazing power of Victor Newman. <laughs> oh, so anyway, the real meat and dirt of I think this whole week of shows was Adam and the fact that he was arrested. They exhumed Constance's body, found that she had been poisoned over a long period of time, and due to Sage's diary, they arrest Adam, and he very luckily gets out on bail, like all within one episode. I think he was arrested and out on bail. So he's in a bit of a sticky wicket. I'm glad that he has Michael as his attorney. Just a little side note, Michael did get his law license back this week and he had a little romantic celebration with Lauren and just so much love between them. I thought that was wonderful. Loved that YNR made time to have Jill meet with Michael and Lauren. It was it was great. Uh, but I, I really don't think te like technical legal maneuvers are going to get Adam out of this and frankly Adam and Chelsea don't believe that either. I was a little surprised that Chelsea's idea for how they were going to get out of this was to bolt. I mean, Chelsea was real quick to suggest that maybe they just need to leave town. They need to go flee. They need to go on the run, take Connor, and never come back to Genoa City, which I think is a terrible idea if you get caught. Connor loses his both of his parents. I mean, like this is Chelsea. Have you been? You've been pulled over. This has happened too many times. <laughs> she's been in this situation too one too many times, and now she's just given into it. Like, yes, let's run from the law. I can't fight it anymore. All of these Newman legal battles. <laughs> um, but yeah, terrible idea. Uh, and, and oddly. Victoria stops by as Ch Chelsea's coming down the stairs with her suitcase ready to, to leave and there was this really great moment where Victoria kind of convinced Adam to stay and to fight and to prove his innocence and it was weird because Victoria is being very Victoria. She is cold and she doesn't like Adam and there's no love loss there but there was a little moment where she actually displayed uh, just a crumb of, of love 
loving at him or or something to that effect as much as she could possibly give and it prompted Adam to go visit Victor one last time and accuse of course he's accusing Victor of being the one to forge the diary and I mean even that meeting with Victor did not seem to change his mind as the sequence of scenes ended for the week Adam is still completely on track with thinking Victor is behind this and weirdly Victor didn't overtly deny being involved in it he just sort of dances around the issue and is looking at Adam and saying you know your problem is you are caught in a web of your own making now which I thought was very haunting you're caught in a web of your own making and then goes on to talk about in Kansas when Adam was a little boy and he brought him a soccer ball and they played together and and you know what is this thing between us son you know and it seemed to me that really what Victor was saying and this is just me was I didn't do this to you I'm not gonna just you know I understand I guess I can't it doesn't matter if I say to you I didn't frame you uh, I, I you're not going to believe it. So what I'll try to do is go in under the radar and say, I am your father, you know, and it wouldn't make it, I mean, it would make sense. It would be, you know, a, a very fitting revenge for Victor to forge a diary, which is something that Adam did to him. But, you know, I, I, I just, I, I tell you, it, it convinced me. Somehow it convinced me. The weird thing was, Adam goes home and tells Chelsea he did it. I mean, Victor did it. He he's forging me, and I don't know how he forged the diary. I don't know how we're gonna get out of this. Victor goes to Doctor uh, Meredith and says to her that he has some. He, he that he didn't do it. Obviously, is what his implication is. But he has some kind of irrefutable evidence that Adam actually did poison constants so it was left on this weird note of well who's lying here is 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 that lying to chelsea i mean did he actually do it and that's you know i mean you know that doubt the, i mean the seed of doubt is already planted between adam and chelsea whether it grows into a big doubt tree i don't know but that it's it's there within their relationship and then for victor like is he lying to meredith because she says to him oh so you had evidence against adam this entire time and you didn't you didn't blow it up in exchange for your own freedom or anything like that which I don't know if that's going to play in later. Is Victor going to be compelled to give evidence against Adam in order to get himself out of prison? Is it possible that he would be presented with that opportunity and, and wouldn't do it? Is there any chance that Victor is telling the truth? Here's my problem, and I will also inject my theory here. Um, I, I don't see how it's possible. How in the heck would it be possible for Victor to have any kind of evidence that anybody was poisoning this old woman in her house, in her closed house. The way I remember it, it seemed like the only people in Constance's life were Sage and Adam at the time of her death. How in the heck, I mean, Victor didn't even know Adam was alive. How in the heck would he have some kind of irrefutable evidence of what was going on inside of that house? And so for that matter, how in the heck could anyone set it up to make it look like this old woman was being poisoned? That's not possible. Nobody went in and exhumed her body and put poison in her system to frame Adam after the fact. She was being poisoned, period. If Unless somebody switched the toxicology reports and there was some sort of finagling on the police end or test end and or something like that the woman was poisoned so the question is who would have been poisoning her and i will assert to you the thing that makes the most sense to me is i think it was sage i don't think it was adam adam has absolutely no reason to really want to get constance out of the way and it just doesn't seem like a very adam move i think adam was ready to leave that house whether constance was alive or not the fact that it happened 
worked out for him. He was able to go and be a little more free and resume his life. The person who wasn't free was Sage. And Sage, I, I, I'm just telling you, I feel like maybe she was writing in her diary about the fact that Adam poisoned Constance as an insurance policy. I could see Sage you know, knowing that Adam switched those paternity results and maybe deciding to write it down saying, oh, Adam poisoned Constance, uh, and knowing that she could easily frame him for it just in case Adam ever decided to try to take Christian back or to try to do anything. She knew, Adam knew her biggest secret that she never wanted uh, Nick or anybody else to find out. That gives her motive for framing Adam and furthermore, I think that she has the biggest motive of all for poisoning uh, Constance. It was, I, I mean, like, Constance's death was the key to Sage's freedom. Think about what Sage's life looked like when she was at that mansion. It was servicing Constance, constantly doing everything she could to try to help her. And I, I mean, there is the factor of she was trying to uh, save Constance from knowing that her grandson Gabriel had died. But frankly, Sage was also trying to save herself from the man that she loved having died. And we know Sage is not a saint. Sage was not, not a liar. Sage was perfectly fine lying about things. I, I, I wouldn't have guessed that it would have been Sage, but then there's a part of me that thinks that YNR could easily spin this and pin it on Sage. She's dead. Who cares? Nobody's going to ask. Adam didn't do it. Adam's not going to be the one to go down for it. And I just can't see it being Victor either. I mean, uh, you know, I, I it just it doesn't make any sense to me personally that YNR would take that particular route. I mean, yes, a storyline can take any number of twists and turns, but I just don't think they're going to pin it on any of the main characters. There's just got to be some other weird factor in here. And to me, just given the information and the characters that we know now, everybody that's on the scene now, it would make the most sense to me that whoever poisoned Constance was someone who was in that house, and that would be Sage. But that's just my opinion. I know there's a lot of them rolling around out there, and that is this week's poll question. Who's framing Adam for murder? <laughs> there are a billion different answers out there, I'm sure, and one of them may very well be no one. Maybe no one is framing Adam for murder. Maybe he did it. I mean, it's not outside of the realm of possibilities. Uh, frankly, do you buy my uh, do you buy my theory that it could have been Sage? Do, are you still stuck thinking that, you know what, this is exactly a Victor move? Uh, or, like, could it be some other kind of plot twist that we don't see coming uh, uh, as someone who could be framing Adam who might have a modem against him, such as the real Gabriel? Or could it be some kind of like new casting twist that's coming out of left field? Someone who's not even on the show right now. Could it be someone like Chloe who would have a motive for framing Adam? I mean, any there's any number of people who could possibly have a motive for framing this man. But this week, I'd love for you to speculate on who exactly you think is framing Adam. Is it no one? Is it Victor? Is it Sage? Could it be someone like Gabriel or Chloe? Or maybe you have some other theory yrchat.com is where you can vote in the poll and leave your other comments. And if you have any other theories that I haven't mentioned, I'd love to hear them. I'm always sad every time that Nikki and Victor break up. Every time. All the times. It's their cycle. They break up. They make up. They get remarried. This is just where we happen to be in the cycle at this very moment. Uh, but I've I mean, let's be real. Who could possibly blame Nikki for wanting the divorce? It's the right move for her. What's she supposed to do? Live in limbo with a man who's in prison and who says that he doesn't want her. If Victor was in prison and pledging his love to her, it would be a different story. But he's not. Every time she's tried to reach out to him, he rejects her. And I'm not saying he doesn't have a reason to reject her. The woman testified against him in court, made him look like a fool, and got him sent to federal prison for 10 years. But I, I also, at the same time, don't blame her. I don't understand why she wanted to stay with him in the first place. If he did all these things, and why would you want to testify against him and expect to stay married, want to stay married to him? 
Oh my goodness. Of course, little Summer has to be sniffing around all of the, you know, any happenings in Genoa City. She hears that Nikki's filing for divorce and she's like, no, Grandma, you can't do that to him. Tries so hard to convince Nikki not to do it, but Nikki's like, yeah, um, gonna do it. <laughs> so Summer runs to Victor, gives him a heads up, and of course, Victor has this very tearful reaction, which I couldn't even tell if it was genuine. I don't know anymore. Sometimes we'll get a flashback and Victor will be crying in his cell thinking about his anniversary with Nikki, and then Summer tells him this news and he's crying, and th then as soon as he sees Nikki, he treats her like crap, which makes me think that he was just uh, manipulating Summer in that scene. I mean, just chalk it one up to another way that Summer is being manipulated. It's like the parallels between Summer and young Nikki are are endless. I think it, it absolutely could be made. Uh, and I, I, I don't know, frankly, I was kind of glad to see Nikki go to the jail and uh, like plop down those papers onto the table in front of him. And how beautiful did she look in that scene? Oh my goodness, perfect hair, wearing that long white jacket with the lace sleeves and it had like a lace back. She looked so beautiful, so perfect. It was ironic that she's wearing white, almost, and it almost looked wedding-y on the day that she's serving Victor with divorce papers. Ugh. It was so, so beautiful. And it was, but it was heart wrenching between them because, again, she's like, I really don't, I would prefer it not to be this way. And Victor is still very much angry and resentful. He doesn't give her anything, he doesn't give her any reason uh, to hold on, not even a little inkling of hope. So she leaves. He says, fine, I'll sign your divorce papers. You won't get a fight for me. Uh, you know, I'm not going to fight anything. And so she leaves and she has to go tell Summer about it. It's annoying that Summer has to be handheld hand -held about everything that's going on with her family. I, she doesn't even seem like a Newman to me. She, she seems almost oblivious to any kind of manipulation that that is going on which is so insane because the Newmans are all about manipulation it's kind of their thing um, and I just was I was dying when Nikki's on the park bench trying to like talking to Summer as if she's an eight-year-old needing to understand what divorce is and Summer is just so naive about the relationship and why can't it be fixed and why can't you try and why can't you see Victor and Nikki just says Summer, I don't even recognize Victor anymore. The man in there is not Victor. And I was like, I feel ya. You know, I, I, it's, it's like, I, I think at the same time, like, even though it's not really Victor, because I, I always want to see Victor in the way that I saw him in 1993 when I first clicked onto The Young and the Restless. I want to see Victor as a romantic lead. I want to see Victor as a soft guy. I want to see Victor as the head, strong head of his family. I want to see him loving his wife and his children. And I don't know if that he, he hasn't been that in a while. Like, I mean, Nikki is saying he's not Victor, but at the same time, he probably is. <laughs> like, he probably is the same Victor that he's always been. Maybe it's just taken Nikki, maybe it's just taken me, a lifetime to be able to see it. I mean, Victor is revenge driven. That's the point that Nikki was making to Summer. I'm telling you, this man is lying on his prison cot every single night dreaming right now of the day that he gets out of prison. He's gonna walk into his office, he's gonna throw everyone out, and oh yeah, guess what? He's gonna flaunt his new woman right in Nikki's face. It's so hard to believe it's been another year since Cassie's death. It's been 11 years. 11. I mean, you got to give it to YNR for always acknowledging her the the anniversary of her death. I mean, YNR acknowledges her birthday, 
her, the anniversary of her death. I mean, they really go out of their way to keep Cassie woven into the fabric of the show, which is something that they don't really do with Delia, for instance. I kind of wish they would. I mean, if they're going to, like, have a child who dies too young, I think they should they should acknowledge it. It at least sort of keeps the show accountable when they do horrific things like kill a child. Um, and they don't do it with Delia, but I, I'm glad they do it with Cassie. I mean, 11 years? It's just been so long. And seeing that flashback, it... Oh, it always gets me. Every single time I see it, it gets me because when it happened, I mean, I remember where I was sitting when that aired. I did not see it coming. I had no idea. Absolutely none. And it blew my mind. And that, I think, is why I don't like spoilers. I don't want to know what's going to happen. I don't seek out spoilers. I hate it when I accidentally come across a spoiler because I still remember sitting in that moment watching Cassie and have, like, thinking in my mind, there's no, she's not going to die. I mean, they're not going to kill her. This is just one of those things, you know, she'll come back from, she'll come back from the brink and we'll all go on like nothing ever happened and that never happened and I never I think really got over how shocking that was to me and I like that sense of suspense I think in a lot of ways that's why I watch shows like this I like the storytelling I want to be like I want to get on the roller coaster and I don't want to know where it's going I just want to go along for the ride and sometimes it will rock your face off Oh, and that was one of those moments you couldn't believe it. Just nothing could compare, nothing, with the pure shock I felt during that moment when Cassie slipped away from us. And, and how great is it that we have Mariah now? I mean, it is really, truly awesome. I remember saying, I wish YNR would just do something and bring back Cassie because I, I, I just liked her and I just thought she would add so much to the show. And voila! twin we have Mariah and it's just so, it's so nice that YNR was able to pull that off and that Mariah is so very well incorporated into the show now I loved that after all of the anniversaries of Cassie's death that we've had I, I loved that we actually got Mariah's perspective in there she says I have a twin and I never knew her and you know what would it be like if she would be alive today would she understand what I'm going through would I understand what she's going Going through that's a perspective on Cassie's death that even though we've probably had 11 different anniversary shows of Cassie's death we've never had Mariah's eyes on it and I just thought it was so cool to finally get to see how she was feeling the actress looked beautiful in that scene I loved her up to loved her dress it matched perfectly with her gorgeous red hair I love Mariah's attitude and I want to see more of her uh, I just think she's great and I was I was so glad to see YNR not only focusing on Mariah's feelings about her sister this week but focusing on that friendship with Kevin and finally seeing Kevin make the right decision decision. He's all caught up with Natalie and all of the fabulous, hard to do, uh, expensive activities that they can do together. Um, uh, Natalie's got a helicopter ride arranged for some pop-up restaurant in Chicago or somewhere and they were they're gonna, they were going to go and uh, eat some fancy fancy meal and it was big and elaborate and Kevin bumps into Mariah before they leave and Mariah's just so distraught and feeling so so crappy and she just says I just want to like go and sit on a couch and eat food and watch movies and just take my mind off of everything I mean the weight of not only Cassie but we know what's going on in her head about Sharon um, you know just she wants to forget about it for a little bit and she just in a moment of weakness says is there any chance that could happen and by the way that was after she kissed him I almost forgot to talk about that she planted a kiss on him uh, and it was just like it was a series of sort of breakdowns for Mariah she was just unable to keep up that really fierce persona that wall that stone wall that she keeps up around her at all times and we saw her, you know, we saw that wall kind of crumbling a little bit this week. And she, for a moment, reached out to Kevin and said, can we just please get out of here? And he made the right decision. 
and he knows he has these plans with Natalie that are sort of expensive and irreplaceable and instead he chooses the couch and some Chinese food and some chill out time with Mariah. I loved it. Finally, yay. I mean, again, I keep saying it. I'm not necessarily... I'm not necessarily invested in the romantic relationship with Mariah and Kevin. It just doesn't seem to work. Um, and maybe if they tried a little harder, it would. But I don't know. It doesn't work for me right now. But the friendship works. And so I was glad to see that. I was glad to see Mariah. She's become somehow like the conscience or one of them of the show. Uh, or at the very least, she's become the conscience of Sharon. This town is full of people who've been given second chances. That was last week's Who Said It quote. It was Jack who said it. I thought it was a great observation that he was making. He was actually um, arguing with Phyllis uh, uh, regarding Hillary. He was making an argument that maybe we need to forgive and forget when it comes to Hillary. And I just, I, I thought, you know, it is true. The town is full of people who've been given second chances. And, you know, even as fans we've been we decide to give these people second chances it was just, just such an apt statement and again he made there was another instance where i think when jill was pleading with jack and phyllis to go talk to billy uh jill looked at jack and says he is squandering his second chance billy's somebody who almost died he came back and now he's got the second chance and he's he's squandering it he's blowing it and that was part of i just thought it was interesting that jill kind of appealed to jack and the second chance after he had just been kind of preaching that about hillary so a uh, really good line and i think everybody who guessed it pretty much got it right so I, i'm going to take a deep breath and read your names and hope i hope i get everybody um so the people who got that quote right were jen t nicole Aaron, Sandra, Troy, Victoria, Austin, and Naomi, Lindy, Sonia, Consuela, Tanya, Sean, Connor, who is gonna, on a cruise right now. He's soaking up some rays right now while I'm, I'm stuck here in just hot old boring Midwest. <laughs> uh, Dylan got it right also. Nathalie, that's an interesting name, Nathalie, and Sharita. So you guys did really good. You guys caught it. But I don't know if you're gonna get this one because it was quick, but oh, it was so good. This week's Who Said It quote, what is so great about the truth? <sighs> I love that line. <laughs> I, I hope that you guys heard it. Um, if you heard it and you think you know who said it, you can go to yrchat.com to leave your guess. What is so great about the truth? Mm, just too good. Too good writing. The writing has been superb this week. It really has. Um, but if you think you know who said it, you can go to the website there. Leave your guess. If you get it right, I will give you your shout out on next week's YNR Chat. I have two pages of comments this week. You guys are really, really chatty. <laughs> so I'm going to get right to them. This, this made me laugh. James at YRChat.com says, not a bad prison life for Victor. Frequent visitors, no need for visitor times, walks around freely, and most of all, he gets to make out with the hot prison doctor. <laughs> I love that because I'm always thinking it. I'm always thinking it's like, it's just he's holding court in prison. It's ridiculous the way people come and go and the guards just give him so much leeway. It's I, I have to suspend my disbelief on that one because it's too much. Uh, Aaron on YouTube says, I love the fact that Nikki is divorcing Victor. We all know that Nikki's alcohol trigger is Victor, but we also know that this is a plot device to hook up Victor with Meredith for the season. And we all know that Nikki will come back to Victor sooner or later. Yeah. It kind of reminds me, this is weird, but I like it kind of does remind me, I'm thinking back to the farm, uh, Hope's Farm, where Victor was presumed dead. I mean, where I, and, and comparing it to now where they're almost sort of treating him like he's dead and he's treating them like they're dead. Uh, when Victor, 
was at the farm with Hope, developed this relationship with her, and he brings her when he comes back to town with him and flaunts her, you know, as sort of his his new woman. And I, I think that's what he's going to do with Meredith. I think he's going to make his grand resurrection and from the dead, and he's going to have his new woman, Meredith, to cram down all of their throats. And she's she's going to see. She's going to see him for what he really is, just like Nikki did, just like Summer's going to. It's, it's the, you have to eventually. He's not a wilting flower. He's Victor Newman. Daisy on Facebook says, now that Luca has fessed up to getting Adam fired, likely for Victor, um, I wonder if Victor told Luca to get close to Summer, then convince her to conduct Newman Enterprises business behind Victoria's back. And Summer is that naive, she may just follow along or she just follows along. I, I know, I keep wondering like to what extent is Victor really um, manipulating or pulling the strings on what's going on in the lives of the people on the outside or like how much of it is us being paranoid and assuming that Victor is behind everything because wouldn't it be uh, just sort of like a good twist of if everybody is just super paranoid about you know Victor and maybe he's not behind it but it's just it's the pattern right I mean Victor's pretty much always behind everything so it, it makes sense um, Samuel on YouTube says, I am so irritated with Summer. She's always running to Victor, telling him everything that's going on on the outside world. She needs to stay in a child's place and out of grown folks' business. And Consuela at YRChat.com says, Summer is so naive. It's not just that Luca manipulates Summer's emotions, but also Victor. Yes, you guys. I mean, it is that. I guess that's the thing. It's really painting Summer in a bad light. I think that it's cool to see Summer pushed into the forefront where she's making decisions and doing things, but she just comes off as kind of weak and just sort of wimpy, and it doesn't feel like she's making her own decisions. I guess that's the thing. If Summer were up front, center, you know, making power moves, it would it would be okay or it would be interesting, but she's just really letting somebody, you know, whether it's Victor or whether it's Luca, make the decisions for her, and it just comes off as kind of weak and whiny. <laughs> um, Justin <laughs> left me a voicemail. I got a lot of good comments too about this this week. Justin says, Jill said what we were all thinking. <laughs> what in the hell did you do to Catherine's house, Billy? I just wanted to stand up and clap in front of TV. Uh, in front of the TV. I'm, I'm not even that much of a Jill fan, but that was a golden moment right there, Justin says. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really just kept thinking, Y&R had just had to be like knowing that it was coming almost from the fans perspective. It really, really felt like they were acknowledging that the fans weren't really happy with it. We did a poll on it. We've talked about it. And it just seemed like the majority of people were like, ew, the house looks terrible. There's no honor to Catherine. There's like one little picture. We didn't even see that drawing uh, up on the wall until this week. We saw one picture of Jill and Catherine sitting on that bookshelf, no, never the drawing until this week. And I just, I kept thinking that YNR almost like was acknowledging the fact that they screwed that up a little bit. Um, Gary uh, left a voicemail talking about the mansion and Jill and uh, Gary made a good point saying from the beginning of Catherine and Jill that house really did play an important part in the story. It was almost like another character in the story. It was just so prominent. And I like that comment Gary because I, I wasn't really watching at the beginning of Catherine and Jill. I came on sort of at you know at the, the peak but you know and from my perspective I remember when they were literally battling over the house when the house was Catherine's and Jill went up into the attic one day and just so happened to find a second will of Phillips that left Jill part of the house or something and they went to court over it and and that's why when Jill said this house was our battleground or battlefield I can't remember uh, it just it struck me because that's exactly what I remember and you know as Gary's saying there is so much history just in that house in that set I mean in those walls and it, YNR did kind of trample over that uh, they, they 
they did just revise that without really, I think, considering the fans. And so in some ways, it does feel, as Justin was saying, that like Jill's reaction was just like ours. You know, that was our way of getting our voice into the script. And again, it was just so well written all week. Um, John at YRChat.com theorizes, what if Phyllis becomes pregnant? <sighs> Is the father Jack or Billy? That would put her in the same situation she was in when she was pregnant with Summer. And can the writers really do that to Jack again? I hadn't thought about that, John, that Phyllis might become pregnant. Can she get pregnant? For some reason, I think her and Jack had trouble conceiving, but then she went on to have Summer, right? Is that it? Something. There is something with it. But oh my gosh, that would be so scandalous. Because this secret's going to come out one way or another. I don't know. I I tell you, I kind of think it's Hillary. I feel like Hillary is the one that's going to bust this up. Um, did I mention or talk about the great uh, interaction between Jill and Hillary? OMG. I probably could have spent an hour just talking about how great it was to see those two going out at it. Hillary just, she it doesn't matter who it is. I mean, Jill is probably one of the most respected, uh, well, maybe not by the other members of Genoa City, but I mean, I, I think of Jill as someone who commands respect and, and Hillary doesn't care. She's just perfectly fine to dig in her claws no matter what. And I loved, I just loved that, you know, Hillary was trying to come off with this air of, of respecting Catherine and Jill was like, you didn't even meet her. Okay, um, but Jill ended up winning in the end and Hillary had a little bit of egg on her face. I also need to mention too that Lily had a moment with Devon where she says to him, haven't you kind of noticed the way that Hillary is smiling and being all happy around Jack? Don't you think that's suspicious? And it seemed like it really hurt Devon because it's just, Devon doesn't want to hear it. He don't want to see it. He doesn't want to see that Hillary is manipulating, and he certainly doesn't want to feel like Hillary is manipulating him. I don't know if Lily got through uh, or not, but I, 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 I just still, I can't, I don't think Hillary's got eyes eyes for Jack. I think she, just, she has eyes for her. her. Hillary's number one priority is Hillary. Okay, back to Billy and Phyllis. Beatrice left me a voicemail saying she remembers Bethany Billy's girl from this week from Days of Our Lives. And I kind of want to say I read that that actress was on another show, maybe as the world turns or all my children, something like that. Uh, but uh, Gina had left me a voicemail and told me that the woman who played Bethany um, is uh, Justin Hartley Adams' real life girlfriend, which I, that kind of blew my mind because I had read a spoiler that Justin Hartley's girlfriend was going to be coming on the show to have a little role, but I didn't know when or who it was going to be. And I didn't know after the fact until Gina mentioned it that that was her, that that was his girlfriend. I, you know, I really thought she was beautiful. I thought she was poised. I thought she just seemed sweet and bubbly and I like her personality has nothing to do with Justin Hartley. Um, I, I immediately, before I even knew that, was like, I kind of like this girl. She just seems friendly. And I liked that even though she did sleep with Billy, she was not slutty about it. Yeah, I don't know, somehow. She had, and it was, I just felt bad for her the way he called her Brittany. That was so sad. Uh, but so how long is that going to be? Do you guys know if the actress is having a long stint on the show? Are we going to see her again? Or was it just... Uh, that episode. I'm not sure. Okay, let's talk about uh, Adam and Chelsea here. I uh, I got quite a few comments uh, from last week's YNR vlog, so I have a, a, a correction to make. I was theorizing I don't know why I did this, but I was theorizing that somehow this mess that's legal mess that's going on with Adam was going to force him to have to show Sage's letter to uh, to the cops or to Nick or somebody. When I knew in my in my mind, I, like, I knew I remembered that Adam and Chelsea burned that letter. So I'm kind of mad at myself that I would say that or think that when two weeks earlier I watched them burn the letter. We talked about it on Why in our chat and then it just, phew, that piece 
piece of information just flew right out of my brain and, and, and left. So I'm sorry that I got that uh, that wrong. Um, that's my fault entirely. It'll get worse as I get older too. So let's say I'm YNR chatting uh, year 20. It's gonna be it's gonna be a fun one. I'm gonna get the characters' names wrong too. My brain is gonna go. Um, I also I have to say uh, hi to Lindy because she called uh, to mention the burned letter and also to mention that she's been watching the show since 1975 and this was the first time I heard from Lindy too I love hearing from new people that's it's, it's just always fun to hear a new voice on the voicemail or a new see a new chatter on the website so that's always a always a treat for me um, Gary also <laughs> this made me laugh too uh, early in the week said have you ever seen the Chancellor Park carousel we have a carousel in that park. <laughs> that made me laugh because that that little bistro is really being developed. We saw a lot of it this week, and uh, there's that big sign, uh, that Chancellor of uh, the Chancellor Park sign, and uh, it also says, by the way, that there's a, a duck pond. <laughs> there's a carousel going one way and a duck pond going the other way. You think we'll ever ever see any of those? I, I sort of doubt it, but uh, I I, ha I wanted to take that opportunity to to say I think it's a beautiful set if you look at the trees in the background they kind of have these sort of cherry blossoms on it it just looks very beautiful they're apparently serving champagne in the park now how many public parks of course I guess it's not public I suppose it's private like there's bad stuff that go down in that park too didn't somebody shoot Victor or Jack yeah Marco shot Victor or Jack or somebody in that park like shady stuff goes down in the park but then they also sure serve champagne and ice cream <laughs> <laughs> oh, which is fun. So I'm really digging the park. I love it. Um, and Gary also mentioned on the issue of Adam. This is early in the week, so maybe you changed your opinion, but I, I had to point it out because Gary says, if Victor did frame Adam, that's pure evil. How can he ever come back from this? I thought the point of him going to prison was the eventual redemption of Victor Newman. And I like that point, Gary, because that's exactly what makes me think that Victor's not behind the framing. Because I get that vibe too. Like, Victor went to prison so that we can, on some level, start to like him again. I just can't see the writers throwing all that out the window and pinning out of ever after everything and the trial and all of this and how much the fans don't even like Victor anymore. I just can't see them pinning uh, the, the the framing on, you know, on Victor. I just think it's going to be an outside force. And there is a part of me that just thinks everyone is sort of being paranoid at this point about how much Victor really is involved in their lives. The other thing I want to say, by the way, is that, you know, the way Gary says it's, you know, it's, it's evil if Victor does, had done that to his son. And that's like pretty much what everyone has said. Everybody is disgusted with Victor if he would frame his own son for murder. But, you know, I gotta mention, Adam did it. Like, nobody's talking about that. Nobody's going back and saying, oh, can you believe that Adam actually tried to frame Victor for a murder? I mean, Adam explained himself to Michael this week and why it would be fitting for Victor to be the one to frame him, and he sort of brushes it off. He sort of says, well, yeah, the reason it's significant is because I kind of worked with Jack to forge a diary to frame Victor for murder, too. You know, and that, it's sort of a little, you know, it's a kind of a afterthought. It's a off the cuff. You know, yeah, I did it, too, but we all forgive Adam because he's sexy, and Victor, it's pure evil. Just had to point it out. <laughs> the sex factor cannot be overlooked. And maybe that's why Victor gives, rubs his mustache on Meredith's face and then steps back to wonder if his sex power is still full in effect. Well, with the fans, I would say not. Um, Gina, on the other hand, left a voicemail saying, deep down, I'm sure that Victor is framing Adam. When he first, uh, when uh, he first came on the show, no, sorry, uh, and then deep down, <laughs> sorry, I'm screwing this up because I think I missed a line uh, that I wrote down. Deep down, I'm sure that Victor is behind framing Adam. And then Gina wants, like, kind of talked about Dr. Meredith saying, when she first came on the show, I thought she was going to be able to get through to him, but she's just feeding right out of his hand. I know, it is really disappointing that Meredith has become this other naive character. Uh, I really thought she was going to have a little more oomph, but I like the actress a lot. I hate to see her get sucked into his whole world of bleh. 
Um, Clinton, aka Captain Hillster, wink wink, awesome, uh, left me a voicemail saying, we've done the Victor Adam triangle before. I mean, it's like it's like it's over. I, you know, I kind of agree. And I almost wonder if that's another thing that YNR is just saying, let's bring this up to make Adam think that it that it would be Victor because we have this sort of in the in the uh, in the in the history of the show. But I almost wonder if that's the red herring that it's someone else. I don't know if you guys are thinking that still or if it's just me. I just I'm not believing it. Um, B eight no hold on B X girl H S on YouTube. <laughs> I've said that before and I don't know why that one stumped me. B X girl H S on YouTube says I think this journal thing is interesting since Adam did set Victor up for murder with a journal a long time ago. But I also feel like all signs point to Victor conveniently. I have a feeling this is a long story where we find out that this is the work of the real Gabriel Bingham. We are probably going to see a trial where Adam is sentenced to jail and or goes on the run, which uh, will be used to write him off the show until they find uh, a new Adam. I don't know. I don't know that um, Justin Hartley is not going to be on the show. I kind of think that he's going to be doing both for now anyway. I haven't heard any uh, confirmation that he's leaving YNR on any way. He seems to like it. He really fits it. Um, but they may uh, definitely work his other projects into the show. I think YNR will try really hard to keep him. But what I really love is your point about Gabriel. Uh, I've heard little bits of rumblings here and there throughout the week that the real Gabriel Bingham might have been the one to poison Constance. But why? I mean, I think you're right. I mean, and I think I'm almost sort of, if it's not Sage, I would say my second guess would be that it was Gabriel who was who was uh, poisoning his grandmother. But it just still makes me wonder why. Why would he do that? What would be his motive? He didn't get any money from her estate and she really wasn't involved in his life. Uh, but I kind of, a lot of people have been talking about that. Uh, and I kind of, I can kind of see it happening. Do we know any casting updates that might point in that direction? Uh, Jamie left me a voicemail saying, I keep getting this feeling that YNR is going to make Gabriel, the actual Gabriel, the killer of Delia. And maybe that's why Travis is so mysterious. It would be an opportunity to vindicate a YNR fan favorite. I don't know if, I almost can't see YNR going back to the Delia thing. Uh, it's like, if they were going to vindicate Adam uh, for Delia's death, dang, I wish they would have done it years ago. But I really like your point about Travis because I have heard rumblings about that too. I've heard a lot of people say maybe Travis is the real Gabriel Bingham, mind blown. And let's end up with one more theory here. Sean at YRChat.com says, I just read an article that Elizabeth Hendricks and Chloe might be returning to the scene. Maybe Chloe is the one behind framing Adam. Ooh, I saw that article too. It's, it's, it's a rumor, I have to say. I don't usually like to confirm anything until I see it on uh, one of the big sites because I, I, I think I, I saw the article on Daytime Confidential and they're right a lot of the time, but they've been wrong and I'm always afraid to, <laughs> to, to say it until it's been confirmed. But if, since it's out there and since it's rumbling, if Chloe is going to be returning onto the scene, I mean, who wouldn't, uh, who wouldn't have a bigger motive for framing Adam? She absolutely has uh, the, the, the reason and the crazy to pull it off. Okay, everybody. I think that does it for me for this week. Thank you all so much for the wonderful eight year anniversary. Happy anniversary messages. That was really fun for me to read all week. I can't believe it's been eight years. Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to do something special for 10 years. <laughs> uh, but I really, really appreciate all of the love and all of the comments. It really, really made my week better. So here's uh, eight years and one week week <laughs> and we'll keep going and see where we are starting with next week so if you guys would like to leave me your comments you can go to yrchat.com leave comments on the blog or find the links to Facebook and YouTube uh, and the podcast hello shout out podcast peeps and uh, there's also the voicemail which I love listening to 309-588- Four, five, six, nine. I think you get three minutes and one second for each each voicemail. So feel free to use one or more to get your point in. I do enjoy hearing your guys's 
theories and thoughts and I really really hope you vote on this poll and tell me who you think is framing Adam if anyone. Uh, that'll be interesting uh, to see those results and to see if we've made any progress on figuring that out before we get to next week. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> okay you guys everybody have a really good weekend and a really good uh, Memorial Day and a good week next week and I'll be back next Sunday to chat with you. Bye!